On the 24th of August 1830, Thomas Huntingford, a Gloucester magistrate, wrote to the Home Secretary Robert Peel. In his letter, he expressed his concern at the growing number of paupers, those unable to support themselves. This was not born of humanitarianism. Instead, his concern was with the rising number of supposedly idle poor, those refusing work. Many, I believe, he wrote, commence begging from real distress and continue it from finding it to be an easy, idle and profitable mode of sustaining a livelihood. The only way to check this behaviour locally, he continued, was to commit the beggars to a house of correction in North Leach, but this was often full. Far better, Huntingford wrote, if justices of the peace would be given the power to have beggars whipped on the spot by the nearest constable. This concept of an idle or undeserving poor was not simply a matter of prejudice. It was a formal classification of pauper to be found in the 1601 Poor Law Act, alongside the able-bodied poor who couldn't find work and the impotent poor who were too ill, old or young to work. These last two categories were deemed to be more deserving of relief. The concept of an idle, undeserving poor and the notion held by poor ratepayers that their numbers were increasing is key to understanding the motivation behind the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834. The new Poor Law, as it was also called, represented a major change to how poverty was addressed. Under the old system, dating back to the late 16th century, each parish was responsible for looking after its own poor, from funds raised by a special rate paid by wealthier inhabitants. Relief then traditionally took the form of a payment, but during the 18th century, it had become more commonplace for relief to be tied to a stay in the parish workhouse. However, even this was deemed too generous by some observers. As Thomas Wallace wrote in 1830, I consider the present multiplicity of poorhouses an inducement to the idle and the dissolute to throw themselves upon the parish as in the outdoor poor. The continuity of residence, the frequent intercourse they have with each other, the ready access to their friends and the easy means of inebriation which is afforded tend greatly to increase that spirit of avowed pauperism, which in reality does not exist. Four years later, Wallace would have been satisfied with the harsher workhouse conditions created by the new poor law. Husbands were separated from wives, children from parents, and the inmates were put to menial and sometimes meaningless hard labour. In the infamous Andover workhouse scandal, inmates set the task of crushing bones, were so hungry they were found eating the rotten marrow within. And what is more, there were now to be workhouses not just for the idle poor, but for the able-bodied and impotent poor as well.